Hello and welcome to today's webinar being hosted by the Atlantic Council's Pakistan Initiative. My name is Uzair Yunus. I'm the director of the initiative. And on behalf of my colleagues here at the South Asia Center, I wanted to welcome you all. Good afternoon, good evening um, to all of you for joining today. And thank you to all of you for joining today. Um, we're going to be talking about a very important topic um, related to the rise and fall of Abraj, um, a private equity firm that did a lot of impact investing in emerging markets, but um, subsequently had several financial issues that led to its eventual uh, end. Um, we're going to be discussing what this story was all about uh, by the co-author of the book that covers this topic. And joining me today to moderate this discussion is the non-resident senior fellow at the South Asia Center and a dear friend of mine, Safia Gori Ahmed. Safia is regional director at McLarty Associates um, and leads the South Asia work at the firm. Uh, she helps coordinate the businesses, business development and client management efforts. Um, and prior to working at McLarty, Safia also served on the staff at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee covering South and Central Asia. Uh, prior to that, Safia was an advisor on Pakistan and Afghanistan in the Office of the Special Representative to Afghanistan and Pakistan under Secretaries Clinton and Kerry. So Safia is going to be uh, moderating this discussion, asking initial set of questions, um, and then bringing in questions from the audience on this topic as well. And so with that, I will hand it over to Safia and over to you. Thank you so much, Azair. Thank you to the Atlantic Council uh, and the South Asia Center for hosting today's conversation. Um, I'm very excited to introduce Simon Clark, who's a journalist and author, who authored the book, The Key Man, uh, with colleagues at the Wall Street Journal and broke the story uh, of, of uh, the downfall of Abraj in 2018. Uh, he wrote the book with his colleague, uh, Will Louch. Uh, and so we're really excited to have you here with us, Simon. Um, I, I have to admit, I read the book in two days. It's an amazing read. I really enjoyed it. Um, and so congratulations on the book and we're excited to have you here. Uh, hi, Sakhi. Hi. Thank yeah. you, it's great to be here. Thank you, thanks, Simon. Uh, if it's okay, I'm gonna jump right in. I have questions and like Uzair mentioned, I will um, kick it off with a couple of questions and then I'd love to open it up to the uh, attendees uh, of today's webinar. Um, so uh, just jumping right in, Arif Nafi um, was telling investors that Abraj could make money for investors and end poverty at the same time, which is such a compelling narrative. Um, so I'd love to ask for your thoughts on does impact investing work and can you make money and make the world a better place at the same time? The short answer to that is yes, it can work, uh, but it is difficult to make money and it is difficult to end poverty. And it is very difficult to do those two things at the same time. So impact investing has fast become a, a very large movement. I see it as a twin of the ESG movement, environmental social governance movement. So there's this drive in finance to find a way to uh, invest money profitably and resolve social and environmental problems at the same time. Um, this is a very appealing narrative. It's very seductive. It's great if it works. Um, this narrative is being spurred by the COP26 talks in uh, Glasgow in, in November last year, where we have bankers and fund managers um, who are now saying that they can channel trillions of dollars into projects around the world to transform the economy from a fossil fuel based economy to a green economy at the same time as lifting people out of poverty. It's a big narrative. Now, Abraj, uh, which was the largest private equity firm operating in emerging markets before it collapsed in 2018, um, was an early adopter of the language of impact investing and of impact investing. Um, they did some successful deals. They also did some very problematic deals, which I expect we're gonna talk about. The big problem with impact investing is that it sounds great. And if investors do what they say, then, then that's great. The trouble is um, it can be used just for PR 
Um, and in certain circumstances, it can be used to cover up fraud. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about today. But to go back to my first answer, yes, it can work, but it's difficult. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I would love to sort of unpack that more as we continue the discussions, because I think that's the crux of why the narrative is so successful um, with investors and, and why, you know, this, this sort of went on for so many years and, and um, our, th that narrative is very compelling. But um, I, I did want to ask you um, about how Abraj was able to maintain that screen of legitimacy for so many years, which ties into this, right, is how do large funders do their due diligence in countries in emerging markets um, or, or in countries like Pakistan specifically? But um, explain to me how Arif Nakfi uh, made it on to boards of organizations like the Interpol Foundation, how um, he was able to gain that sort of legitimacy over the years. So Arif started a barrage in 2001, 2002 in Dubai. And in the beginning, it was a straightforward private equity firm trying to make highly profitable investments. And it did. It did some early, very successful deals, uh, buying and expanding Aramex, um, a delivery company. Um, and as the years went on, Arif, who is a very charismatic, articulate, intelligent person, became something of a star on the conference circuits around the world. There are financial conferences um, which are happening all the time, pre-COVID, where people go to try and raise money from investors, um, from billionaires such as Bill Gates, from banks such as Bank of America, and, and from governments. Governments also invest in private equity funds like Abraj. The US government, the UK government had funds which invested in Abraj. Now, Arif was a great showman. He was a great speaker. He, he seemed to have a lot of credibility because he was coming from a, a fast growing, developing part of the world. And he said he had the expertise to take money from the World Bank or from Bill Gates or from the US government and invest that money in hospitals or companies in Pakistan, India, Kenya, Tanzania in a way that would be profitable and provide goods and services that would help lift people out of those countries out of poverty. He was a great speaker about these issues and there was a degree of success in Abraj's track record, which he used to win the confidence of investors. Um, as he progressed, he, through these conferences, made a powerful network of allies and supporters. Um, you know, Bill Gates invested $100 million in Abraj's $1 billion healthcare fund. When people see Bill Gates investing in a fund, that gives people confidence to invest in that fund as well. Arif successfully built this network out, uh, networking with people at conferences such as the World Economic Forum, which takes place usually in Davos, Switzerland, every January. He expanded a network through these, these, these conferences, and I, as a result of that, he earned very powerful positions, including, as you mentioned, on the board of the Interpol Foundation, which is supposed to raise money for the, the global police force Interpol. He was also on the board of the UN Global Compact, which is supposed to advise the Secretary General of the UN on how to, to end poverty. Um, I think it's fair to say that a lot of those investors and politicians were not scrutinizing well enough the accounts of Abraj because there were serious financial problems at Abraj for many years before the firm collapsed in 2018. So I think there was something of a confidence uh, game going on where being seen with powerful people, being seen with successful people, uh, helped reassure people around the world that that this firm was was successful and and trustworthy. 
I guess my broader question to follow up on that, Simon, is really about, um, you know, I would I would expect that a, a private equity fund or investors are thinking about, you know, when they're thinking about investing millions of dollars, they're they're thinking about the compliance and due diligence and accounts and looking at the sort of numbers. Can you explain to those who may not have read the book a little bit about um, what you found and how, um, you know, what were those compliance standards and what was being shared and what wasn't? Sure. So the story of the key man really begins in January 2018. And, and at that time, Arif was actually in Davos in Switzerland at the World Economic Forum Summit. And he was on a panel with Bill Gates talking about how to provide healthcare to the poorest people in the world. It was a, it was a very interesting conversation. Um, Bill Gates had already invested $100 million in Arif's billion dollar healthcare fund. And, and Arif sounded and looked like a person that really knew what he was talking about. Now, at that time, um, we received an anonymous tip off that from someone who said they were an employee of a Braj, um, an email saying that $200 million had gone missing from that healthcare fund that Bill Gates was an investor in. Uh, and investors were investigating whether or not um, it had been misappropriated or stolen. So, you know, we couldn't use that information to write an article because we didn't know who the source was. And we couldn't use information to write news articles without knowing who's providing the information. But what we could do with that, that email was we could go and ask other people, is this true? You know, we talked to investors also talk to people at a barrage. You know, we've been told $200 million has gone missing. Is it true? And enough people confirmed it to us for us to know that it was true. But when we went to a barrage and formally asked, is this true? The message we got from a very senior uh, executive who was a US citizen who'd previously worked at the World Bank. The message we got from this person was, this is ridiculous. We're a firm of the highest standards. We're regulated in seven jurisdictions. Of course, this is not true. It was true. And we published soon after. And um, Abraj told all its investors initially that that was fake news. Um, it wasn't fake news. And events have subsequently borne out that, that what we reported was true. And that was the beginning of a year that uh, I spent with colleagues at the Wall Street Journal writing about the extent of what had gone wrong at a barrage. Hundreds of millions of dollars had gone missing from multiple funds. Money had been sent into um, Arif's companies and accounts in the Cayman Islands, which that money should have been used to buy companies. Um, we published our article at the end of 2018 with on the front page of the Wall Street Journal showing you know, the extent of the problems. Uh, and then six months after that, um, the United States Department of Justice criminally indicted Arif and five of his colleagues, accusing them of fraud, theft, and attempted bribery. Why didn't investors spot these problems before we did? It's an excellent question. I mean, there are many highly paid executives at investment firms around the world who were committing pension fund money to a barrage, and it was their job to make sure that there were no problems with a barrage. They missed the problems. Um, private equity does enjoy a lot of secrecy. Um, usually if you're an investor in a private equity fund, you often don't get to see financial information about the private equity firm that manages the fund. And that level of secrecy did enable a lot of things to happen at a barrage which should not have happened. Now, then you can say, well, shouldn't the auditors of a barrage have spotted those problems? To which the answer would be yes. The auditor of a barrage was KPMG. There was a very close relationship between KPMG in the UAE and a barrage. Um, Arif and the head of KPMG in, in the UAE were, were close friends. The son of the KPMG chief had worked at Abraj. The chief financial officer of Abraj 
his his CV looks like he was at KPMG, then he was at Barrage, then he went back to KPMG, then he went to a Barrage again. So there's a very close relationship there. KPMG never spotted these problems. And now the liquidators of a Barrage are, are suing KPMG in the UAE. So there is a big dispute there. Um, then you could say, well, what about the regulators? Should they have spotted these problems as well? To which the answer, I think, is yes as well. Um, a barrage did what parts of a barrage were regulated around the world. The principal regulator was supposed to be the Dubai Financial Services Authority. They, um, after a barrage collapsed and after the US government issue, issued these criminal indictments, the Dubai regulator did fine a barrage $315 million for misleading investors, but that was too late. You know, the investors had been misled and there was no money left to pay the fine. So, you know, there are many, many, many problems in the abroad story which show a lack of transparency in global finance and in international private equity. Thank, thank you, Simon. Um, I think that touches on uh, a lot of the narrative that I wanted to, to come out a little bit from that question. Um, but you did touch on the DOJ indictment. So I, I did want to sort of turn a little bit to this alternate alternative narrative um, that Nakvi himself espouses. And, you know, he has been indicted by the DOJ on multiple criminal charges, but he says he's innocent um, and he is fighting extradition to the U.S. He says he has been caught up in the geopolitics uh, between the U.S. and China and um, his dealings on the sale of Karachi Electric. Can you speak to us a little bit about this narrative? Yes, um, there is no evidence for this narrative. I mean, that's the short answer. Now, the longer answer is, um, I first interviewed Arif in, I think it was 2007 in Dubai, and I've been writing about private equity for over 15 years. Um, we started investigating the problems at Abraj in early 2018. And uh, that investigation went on for almost four years. So in the Key Man book, there are, there are many, many years of reporting. And there pretty much wasn't a day that went past during that period where I and, and my co-author, Will Louch, we, we, we talked to our sources pretty much every day. We were gathering thousands of documents trying to report an incredibly complex story and bring the truth to the world in a way that was fair and accurate and unbiased. And at every opportunity when we heard information, we always shared that information with the people we were writing about. So repeatedly throughout the reporting process, we would go to a barge, we would contact Arif or contact his lawyers and ask him, to comment on what we were finding out. We did that with all the firms we write about, including the auditor KPMG uh, and the investors, whether it's the Gates Foundation or the World Bank. It's an incredibly laborious, painstaking process of reporting. Um, anyway, as we were getting close to preparing to publish The Key Man in July of last year, just before that, we heard that there was another book that was being written about Abraj and Arif. Uh, and this book was, um, it's just called Icarus. Um, we were never contacted by this, 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 this author before this book was published. I, I did meet the author at one of the um, uh, trial hearings for Arif's extradition. But we were never contacted. We were never asked about the information that would be contained in it. Um, the book has a gives a narrative which says that a barrage was brought down by some kind of conspiracy uh, because a barrage was selling Karachi Electric, the main electricity utility in Karachi, a huge city, to Shanghai Electric Power. Now. In um, 
February of last year, uh, a former prime minister of Pakistan, Shahid Kakan Abbasi, was quoted in Dawn, the, the main English language newspaper in Pakistan, where he su suggested that in some way he, he supported this theory. Um, he said in the news article, if a barrage had been allowed to sell its shares in K-Electric to Shanghai, Arif would be a free man today. You tell me, a man who had deep contacts with the most powerful people in the country was unable to resolve administrative hurdles in the sale of his shares, a transaction which had no financial implications for Pakistan and that was hugely beneficial to the country. There is more here than meets the eye. How and why? So this is information coming into the public domain from a, a very important, trustworthy person, a former prime minister. He's not exactly spelling out what he thinks is going on. So I called him and I said to him, you know, you seem to be suggesting there's more here going on than everyone else knows. What's your evidence? What do you know? And, and I did not hear any evidence. What I heard was that there was a suspicion that senior civil servants had been obstructive and that obstructiveness was suspicious. So I asked which civil servant in particular, I got a name and then I tried to contact the civil servant. It took me weeks, but I finally did. And, I, and then I asked this civil servant, uh, did you block the K-Electric sale? And the answer was very direct, was yes. I said, well, why? And the answer again was very clear, because Abraj did not share the share purchase agreement with this civil servant. And this civil servant needed to see the share purchase agreement, which contains all the terms of the transaction, in order to decide whether or not to issue, issue the national security clearance, certif uh, clearance certificate. So because this civil servant was not shown the share purchase agreement, they, he couldn't proceed with authorizing the security certificate. So to me, in my reporting, there are numerous problems with the K-Electric sale. It had huge sort of hidden financial liabilities and there was a question of who would be responsible for them. There's this circular debt issue, which is much discussed in Pakistan. There were other issues which civil servants in Pakistan wanted to be resolved democratically, professionally and transparently. And these were the issues that my reporting shows are the reasons why the transaction did not complete. Now, there's other issues with the Icarus narrative, which I think are problematic. You know, even if Karachi Electric had been sold, that doesn't explain away the massive amount of alleged fraud, which, you know, my reporting and the Department, US Department of Justice's indictment shows. Um, so it's not as if everything would have been fine if. K Electric had been sold. I mean, there were problems in the way a barrage was managed. Uh, that's what the reporting shows, and that's what the, all the legal claims are saying. So, um, you know, what what we wrote in the Key Man was based on our hard won reporting. We provide our sourcing at the back of the book in the notes. Um, and we could not write what we could not show to be true, basically. Um, there is no evidence for this other theory of a conspiracy. Thanks, Simon. I, I wanted to make sure we, we get that out there. So I appreciate you, sh you sharing that. Um, if I could, I, I, this is probably going to be my last question, and then I want to open it up for our, our um, audience and our attendees to, to ask questions. And so if they could sort of start thinking them through and putting them through the chat feature, I will um, I will uh, pose those to you, Simon, uh, after this next question. But if I could, I want to turn away from the book for a moment and shift a bit to your own experiences in Pakistan. And if you could share that a little bit with us. But as we pivot from this conversation, 
I do feel the need to say that I, I want to highlight that this case around our Nakvi has nothing to do with him being Pakistani or him being Muslim or it has anything to do with Islam. You know, fraud and crime don't take on a faith or nationality. And we saw that with Bernie Madoff. We've seen that with with tons of other cases. So I just want to put that out there. Um, something we've covered here at the Atlantic Council is, is the startup ecosystem in Pakistan, which has been booming over the last um, year or so in the last several months in particular. So global investors are pouring money into Pakistan's tech sector, which reports indicate cross something like 300 million in funding in the last year. So I would love to get your thoughts and advice to investors who are looking towards Pakistan as an untapped market, which it is, uh, with huge potential opportunities. Yeah, I think Pakistan is a wonderful, fabulous country. I lived in Pakistan when I was 18. Um, about nine months I spent there. I was a volunteer teacher um, in, at Lawrence College in Murray in the north. I traveled to every province um, and it is an extraordinary, beautiful country and the people are the most amazing, friendly people I've met in the world. It is a country that I, I have a care for um, and I wish to see success, being successful. Um, and yes, during the reporting of the Abraj, saga people have accused us of being biased or western or white or you know people have people have there are people who have suggested we have a we have an agenda and a and 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 we do not i mean we try very hard to be professional journalists and being a professional journalist means not having an agenda or as much as is possible not to have an agenda to continue in that vein so we talk about where we may be seeing situations from a certain point of view we try to be aware of any possible biases that we have um so i had an email exchange uh, actually it was a linkedin exchange with a pakistani entrepreneur in july last year and i'd like to read you some of the text because i think this directly answers your your question about you know, what this means for Pakistan. Um, so this is, this, is an, this is a LinkedIn exchange with a Pakistani entrepreneur, who, a person who lives in Pakistan, contacted me and he said that he had been following the Abraj story and he said that it, quote, deeply disturbs me as a Pakistani entrepreneur who looks up to people like Arif Nakvi as an idiosyncratic, charismatic iconoclast. Your story may have brought to light the truth about the impact investment, but it also shatters many Pakistani dreams. It's extremely challenging for us to come out of this identity crisis. The story of Abraj has induced within every Pakistani entrepreneur. I'm looking for your advice as to how you think we, the Pakistani entrepreneurs, can think of this story and Arif and come out of this as better entrepreneurs. So this is the, the message that was sent to me. And I'd like to read you my response. Thank you very much for your message. You ask important questions and I'm keen to help answer them. I was a volunteer teacher in Murray before I attended university. I love Pakistan. I think it is a great country and its citizens are so friendly and smart. Every country has its challenges, including the UK. The problems of Arif Nakvi are not the problems of Pakistan, even if some people might try to convince Pakistanis that his problems are the problems of the whole nation. The important thing is to learn from challenges, understand mistakes, and to not re repeat mistakes. And, and then this person responded to me, Thank you for clearing out ambiguities. The problems of Arif Nakvi are not the problems of Pakistan. This one sentence, to a greater extent, helps structure my thought. So that's my broad answer on this on this uh, this issue. In terms of you know the millions of brilliant Pakistanis and Pakistani entrepreneurs, 
um, and whether investors should invest in their companies, of course they should. And they should assess every opportunity on its merits. You know, you, you, it's not acceptable that investors should say, I don't want to invest in Pakistan because of what happens at a barge. That would be a discriminatory and a wrong thing to say. I mean, when, you, when we consider investments, we have to consider the team uh, and the, the business plan. I mean, that's true in the UK, in the US, in Pakistan. There, there are many problems in the UK. They're in the news all the time. There are many problems in the US. They're in the news all the time. And there are problems in Pakistan. Um, but when it comes to making investment decisions, we need to look at each opportunity individually. I do think that investors are looking at the K Electric situation and they want to see how it will be resolved by the politicians and the investors and the regulators. Will the confusion around the ownership and the future of K Electric be resolved transparently? That would be a good thing. That would give investors more confidence to invest in Pakistan. Thanks, Simon. Um, so now I'm going to turn to a couple of questions that we've gotten from uh, the from the participants. Um, so my first question is from Sayed Fahim. He says, "Thanks for hosting the talk. How badly do you think Abraj's failure has dented the impact investing landscape, particularly in South Asia?" So a lot of um, private equity firms impact investing firms in, in, in so-called developing countries have found it much harder to raise money because of what happened at Abraj. Um, it has dented the, the emerging markets private equity industry. Um, I think that the best way to improve the situation would be transparency from everyone involved you know, learn the lessons from what happened at Abraj. What were, the, what were the problems in the structure of the firm? What were the mistakes that investors made? It would be good to hear from the investors in Abraj. What have they learned? Um, and then move on. I do think that uh, transparency is the best medicine here. But often when there is a financial crisis, um, the people involved quite like to hide. They don't really want to talk about it. They don't want the problems to be made public. Um, and that doesn't help resolve issues. Um, yes, so, so yes, emerging markets private equity has, has a problem. It is harder to raise money. It doesn't have to remain hard forever. And uh, more transparency from big investors would, would help. It would be good to hear from the IFC, which is part of the World Bank, which was a major investor in a barge, you know, more publicly, what lessons have they learned here? What are they going to do different? Um, it would be good to hear publicly from CDC, which is a UK government fund that invested in Abraj, and from the United States Development Finance Corp, which is a US government entity that invested in Abraj. Thank you. Um, so I have another question that I'm going to, um, I think you may have touched on a little bit, but maybe you can elaborate a little bit further. Uh, the second question is, there have been reports that Nakvi, while rightly being investigated, may have walked into the US-China rivalry. Do you agree with this assessment? Uh, no, I think that there is a lot of geopolitical tension, obviously, in the world uh, between the US and China. I think that there is clear indications of that tension in Pakistan often. Um, I don't see how that was specifically a problem for Abraj or for K-Electric. I think, as I've said earlier on, the reasons why the K-Electric sale did not complete was because my sources tell me Abraj was not transparent with the Pakistani government about the transaction. Um, there's geopolitical tension all around the world. Investors have to navigate that. That's part of being a global investor. Um, so I really, I don't, I don't think that the US-China rivalry was a 
significant factor in the abroad situation. Thanks, Simon. Um, another question that we have here is from Amjad Ahmed. Uh, were there other actors who may have enabled abroad, including large asset managers and LPs in London and New York? Does the industry in general have gaps that need to be addressed? Sorry, could you just repeat the beginning of that question again? Sure, sure. Were there other actors who may have enabled abroad, including large asset managers and LPs in London and New York? Does the industry in general have gaps that need to be addressed? Yes, there's lots of gaps in the global private equity industry for a number of reasons. The, fir the funds are not transparent. They're often structured through offshore financial centers, otherwise known as tax havens. So it's very hard to follow financial flows. It's very hard for citizens and journalists. It turns out it's hard for investors. Um, you know, if investment capital is going to save humanity from climate change and poverty, then I don't see why investment capital shouldn't be transparent to the citizens who are going to be saved by this investment capital. I think this is a very important issue, uh, which isn't really thought through and talked through. Um, were there big firms in London and New York that enabled a branch? Yes, and that was their job, you know, to enable their, these, these firms to, to give them money to go and invest and, and earn profits and return those profits. Um, Abraj had many law firms, global law firms, which worked for it. Um, it had big accounting firms, big investment banks. Uh, you know, they would all say that they they didn't know that there was anything going wrong at Abraj. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been doing what they were doing. Um, you know, the story of the key man, as we tell it in the book, shows that. Um, you know, there were seen a few senior executives at the top of Abraj who were mismanaging the money. I mean, the vast majority of the employees at Abraj did not know of the alleged wrongdoing. And it is, it is six former Abraj executives who have been indicted in the US. Two of them have already pleaded guilty. As you said, Arif maintains his innocence and he he doesn't want to be extradited to the US from London to stand trial. So he's uh, appealing the extradition process right now. Um, you know, in emerging markets, private equity for well over a decade. And because of its size and its significance, it was attracting a lot of the investment capital that was available. And ultimately, you know, was that the right thing to be happening? Possibly not. You know, that investment capital needs to be going out to other venture capital, private equity firms, impact investing firms in, in Pakistan and India and Kenya and, and Nigeria. Thanks, Simon. I have a question about the book. Um, and this is more sort of about the 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 way things were, were hidden, the way things were management leadership style within the company. Um, I think about the way RF's brother-in-law who was managing the books um, was pleading with him to, to sort of uh, caving under the pressure and the stress of sort of shifting accounts and shifting money between accounts. And you could feel that in the emails that you relayed in the book. Um, there were people who were caving under the pressure. There were there were sort of this infighting happening at the leadership level. Um, can you talk about RF's leadership style and um, how he was able to keep the ship floating in terms of the way he was? It can't just be that he was paying people large salaries and so they stayed. I mean, there was obviously unhappiness at the firm. There was obviously a leadership style with people afraid of him. Um, people knew things were, were not didn't feel right. Maybe they couldn't put their finger on it. Can you share a little bit about the tone that you got when you were talking to employees, the vibe that you got when you were talking to, to other people in the process of writing the book? So Arif is a, is a very charismatic individual. He, he did inspire the people in his firm and across the sort of industry to believe that that they were on a special mission to 
to sort of break down the barriers between developing countries and developed countries to sort of call out unconscious biases in global capitalism. So Arif would, would refuse to use the term emerging markets and he would insist on, on them being called global growth markets. And, and, and I think they are that both of those terms are accurate to some extent. Um, people talked about him, the firm being like a cult and him being like a god. And he was very inspiring. He was, you know, intellectually and emotionally very articulate. And he, he expected loyalty, absolutely. And he often got it. Um, the individual who you're referring to who was, you know, moving money around and sort of highly stressed out, it was actually uh, Rafiq Lakani, who's not the brother-in-law, but that's Wakar Siddiqui. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. But so that that sort of dialogue of the stress of managing yes. this firm, yeah, and that that does show that even if as people were doing things within a branch which they kind of knew they shouldn't be doing, or they, I mean, which was stressing them out at the very least, um, they were loyal, and and they did it, uh, and and there was sort of you know, even though it was bad for their health. I mean, there were they, th these people were, were on a mission together. Um, you know, ultimately, it's, not, it's for a judge in New York to decide what's happened here and not. And it's also, I think, you know, for readers to read the book and decide. Um, he was very, Arif is very charismatic. And there are, there is, a, you know, there is a pattern of, entrepreneurs, of founders of firms who have this power over the in, other employees in the firm and investors. You know, Steve Jobs at Apple is said to have it. Um, people talk about Elizabeth Holmes at Theranos also, you know, having this big vision and, and being ultimately perhaps too inflexible about it. I mean, leaders need to be able to recognize when something's gone wrong. And, Perhaps that can be difficult for leaders, but ultimately, you know, pretending everything's fine when it's not is probably not a great strategy for, for leadership. Great, great. So I'm gonna turn now to some questions that have come in. This is a great question um, uh, from Zubayd Ahmed. From my perspective, the real reason for RF schemes and ultimate downfall was driven by greed. And he certainly won't be the first person in the history of humankind to be guilty of that. And he gives all these examples of, of, uh, of others who have done so. Can you touch more on your narrative in the book of Arif's early life, where he seemed to always be wanting to keep up with the Joneses and how he cheated his early partners and his zeal to get to the top quickly? Yeah, I, I, I think that the key man is, is, a, is a tragedy uh, in the classic sense of the word. There's... It's a story of a, a very capable person who, um, who, who, who was perhaps too ambitious. I mean, people talk about there being greed here or hubris. Um, what, so what, we, what the book shows is that, you know, Arif was brought, born in Karachi. He went to Karachi Grammar School and people who attended school with him told us that he was very ambitious at that time. He was also perhaps wanted to show those who were more wealthy than him at school that he was on the same level as them as, as measured in wealth, right? I think that's, you know, a risk that we often see in finance. People measure, measure their wealth, they measure, measure their worth by their wealth. And that's, that's always a mistake. Uh, I think perhaps you know, there's that he got a bit wrapped up in that idea. Um, so, you know, that that's 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 why we start the book in Karachi Grammar School. I think there are some of the answers to to what's happened here in 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 in, in Arif's early life. I guess my follow up to that, Simon, would be: Why didn't any of those earlier partners ring any alarm bells publicly? I don't know. I mean, when Abraj was created in 2002 in Dubai, 
it, it, you know, it was pretty much the first private equity firm operating in the Middle East. And, uh, you know, they, they were ma making the industry up as they went along to some extent. Um, I don't know if the people around Arif had a, had a sense of, a, you know, what is the measure of how these things should be done? And perhaps things got out of hand. Um, you know, so what we do know, though, is that um, the Dubai Financial Services Authority has is fining senior executives of Abraj. Uh, it's, it's, it's come out with a couple of the fines already. And, and, and it's pu made public statements about what it thinks these executives did. Um, and the chief financial officer of, of Abraj, Ashish Dave, uh, he's quoted as saying in this regulatory document that, you know, that he's asked, why didn't you blow the whistle? And he said, well, you know, because Arif was too, in his opinion, Arif was too powerful and nothing would come of it. And the only person that would suffer would be him. Um, it's not a great answer. I mean, you know, we found out now that there's a high cost for not doing the right thing. There's a high cost for not walking away from a situation where people don't feel great. So, you know, clearly um, Rafiq Lakani, who was, you know, Arif's lieutenant for decades, was clearly not happy in his work, but he kept doing it. I, you know, I guess it's for some reason it was just too hard for them to walk away or to blow the whistle. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there, there were certain factors in that too, and how, how RF handled people uh, quitting as well. So maybe there is some fear there. But um, I have a question, a couple of questions come in from the audience. One is from uh, Shah Faraz Salim. I imagine auditors and regular regulators around the world are making changes to disclosures and reporting standards after the Abraj episode. Would you speak a little bit more about the transparency you suggest? So what I have heard is that the the World Bank's IFC unit is is being much more demanding of the firms that it invests in now as a, as a, as a consequence of this this abroad collapse. Um, I think. It would make sense to me if I was going to, you know, if an investor is going to invest a hundred million dollars in a private equity fund, it would make sense to me that that investor could also see the financial statements of the private equity firm managing the fund. This has historically not been the case. Uh, perhaps it makes sense that investors were able to see uh more financial information about the firms that they are investing in. The trouble is that there is a tension in the private equity market between the private equity firms and their investors. If a private equity firm it has a very successful track record, then lots of investors will want to invest in its fund. And that gives the private equity firm a lot of power in the relationship with the investors. So there could be a situation where investors are trying to get into a very, very popular fund. And some of the investors say, well, we'd like to see more information, please. And the private equity firm could say to that investor, well, we don't want to give you that information. And we've got these other investors who are quite happy to give us their money without us giving them information, so goodbye. So I do think, you know, that's where regulation comes in, where regulators can require certain levels of disclosure rather than allow firms to decide how much they're gonna disclose, you know. But then, you know, in international funds, you've got funds being incorporated in various jurisdictions around the world, which may have different rules. So if we want to raise the standards globally, then regulators in different jurisdictions need to work together and, and cooperate and agree. And I, I don't know the extent to which that is happening. Thank you. Thanks, Simon. So we have another question from the audience, uh, Mohsen Khan, whose question is, 
Is there evidence in the book that Arif actually siphoned off money to enrich himself in the process? And so I, I guess part of the question is, do you have, have you seen and do you have actual bank statements and indications that this happened where uh, the money was going into his accounts? Uh, yes, we have bank statements showing uh, and other legal filings showing money, you know, huge amounts of money flowing from a barge to Arif's companies and accounts in places like the Cayman Islands. Um, so in 2018, we were able to show from internal documents which we had gathered that more than $600 million had moved out of Abraj's investment funds into a secret bank account at Abraj. Um, that money should have only been used to buy companies, but this $600 million had been siphoned out into a bank account at Abraj. And then from that bank account, more than $200 million was, was sent to companies and accounts belonging to Arif and his family. And this is the center of the uh, criminal indictment and what the in investigators are trying to understand you know th they're still looking for hundreds of millions of dollars that have gone missing um and they've they're trying to get banks around the world to uh help them understand where the money went thanks simon uh, another question has come in from Rizwan Ibrahim. Are there any parallels between what happened at Abraj and what happened at BCCI, um, the Board of Control for Cricket in India decades ago, both on the internal front and how the outside world looked at the two businesses? So BCCI was a bank and Abraj was a private equity firm. So they're different kinds of companies. Um, I know that in Pakistan, a lot of people have drawn parallels between the two firms and the two situations. Um, uh, one parallel, I mean, is that I think the founder of Abraj and the founder of BCCI say they're innocent and they got in trouble with US law enforcement authorities. Um, I don't know the BCCI story well enough to comment beyond that. this, really. Um, I think that ultimately, though, you know, finance works well when managers of finance take responsibility for their actions. And that, that is true of finance managers in the United Kingdom, the United States, and in Pakistan. And I don't hear many people at the top of a barge taking responsibility for what happened. I mean, the only person who I have seen sort of evidence of, of, of taking responsibility is Mustafa Abdul Wadud, who is one of the six indicted abroad executives who has pleaded guilty in the United States. And in his guilty plea, he takes responsibility. He says that things happen which should not have happened. There were things I should have done which I did not do. Uh, he's the only senior abroad executive that I hear taking any responsibility for what happened here. Now, again, the BCCI story, I don't know the details of it you know that these are complicated situations but i think as citizens of pakistan or uk we need to look to where leaders take responsibility for their actions it doesn't mean they have to take responsibility for things they did not do or they don't believe they are responsible for but surely they must be responsible for something and 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 if they're not taking responsibility for anything, then this that that would suggest there is a lack of responsibility here. 
Thanks, Simon. Um, I'll probably wrap it up with this last question that we have, which which turns a little bit to um, what you touched on, sort of this cult of the founder, innovator, visionary, which RF clearly had. Um, uh, but it really turns to beyond calling for more transparency. Are there other rules that can be enforced uh, or imposed to force better behavior? I mean, what what has happened to the senior executives of, at Abraj is pretty pretty tough. Uh, you know, it's not it's not fun to be in the situation that they are in. Um, so, I mean, that 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 is an example of how the law is working i mean i think a lot of people a lot of investors around the world are looking at this situation and and they're probably saying to themselves they would never want to be in this situation um i mean that that would be a learning to take away from this whole saga there are people that say well what about this banker or that banker why didn't they get criminally indicted and you know, those are questions which are fair questions and, you know, will be discussed for a long time to come as well. Well, thank you so much, Simon. I truly enjoyed this conversation. I think our, our attendees and participants did as well. Um, I want to thank Ozer Yunus, uh, Irfan Nuruddin, Hara Samad, and the others at the Atlantic Council, um, the South Asia Center for hosting today's conversation. Uh, I recommend everybody pick up The Key Man. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, read. And Simon, thank you again for joining us today and for facilitating this conversation and for writing the book. Uh, telling this important story. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much, Safia. Thank you. <laughs>